Today's presenter is Katherine Dow. Dr. Dow is a cardiologist and practices medicine with the Washington Township Medical Foundation. Thanks so much, Victoria, and I'm so happy to be here to talk to you today. I'm Katherine Dow, and I'm a general cardiologist with Washington Township Medical Foundation. I have an office just across the street. I'll be talking today about atrial fibrillation, and that is actually the most common cause of debilitating stroke in women. So I'll be talking about the background of atrial fibrillation and what you really need to know about it as a patient if you have it and as a caregiver if one of your loved ones has it. We'll be reviewing the signs and symptoms of atrial fibrillation, how to recognize that you might have atrial fibrillation, and what kind of risk factors you should be targeting in terms of trying to prevent it. I'll talk about how you diagnose atrial fibrillation or how I diagnose it in the office, and we'll and briefly talk about the treatment options. So what is atrial fibrillation? It's a, disor a rhythm disorder. There's a problem with the heart's rhythm. It's often called AFib or AF, and it's a chronic condition that progresses over time. Some people can have AFib intermittently or paroxysmal, where you have it for brief moments, maybe for a few hours, a few days, and you're just sometimes in and out of it. Other people can have AFib more chronically. That's called more persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation. And you can have AFib for a prolonged period of time. As people get older and as the condition progresses, oftentimes you can see that people with, who initially started with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation can progress to chronic atrial fibrillation. When you, someone is an AFib, what's going on is that the heart is starting to beat inefficiently and erratically. The normal heart rhythm is called sinus rhythm. There's actually a cluster of cells in uh, one part of the heart called the sinus node, and it sends signals to the rest of the heart to beat in a coordinated and regular fashion. That's called sinus rhythm. When someone is an AFib, the top chamber, or the atrium, start to stretch, and irregular erratic impulses can form. These take over and cause the heart to beat irregularly, chaotically, and in an irregular rhythm. When this happens, the heart starts to beat inefficiently. In the top chambers, they don't contract as well. They're beating inefficiently and clots can form in the crevices of the atrium. And those clots can sometimes go to the brain and lead to a stroke. That's called an embolic stroke. So you need to recognize your symptoms if you do have atrial fibrillation. And the symptoms can actually be sometimes vague and not straightforward. Many times people can feel rapid or irregular heartbeats or palpitations. You feel like your heart is racing. You feel that you have a pounding sensation in the heart. In the heart. But sometimes it can be more vague. Sometimes patients can just have a feeling of fatigue or that they're not getting a good breath in. They might feel some chest tightness because sometimes the heart is beating very, very fast. Blood flow is not going to the brain well and they feel dizziness or faintness. And other times you can just feel out of rhythm. You just, something's not right. And sometimes patients are actually are not aware that they're in atrial fibrillation. And the only way that they can be diagnosed with it is as they actually see a, a health provider who will examine them or do an EKG to diagnose it. So why is AFib so important in women? Women with AFib are more likely to have a stroke. And AFib is a leading cause of debilitating stroke in women. AFib is actually the most common arrhythmia in elderly patients. And over time, if AFib is untreated, it can lead to heart failure and chronic fatigue and stroke. So it's important to know your risk factors. AFib can happen in anyone. It can happen in younger women, but it's more common in older women. So as you get older, AFib is just more likely to happen. Patients with high blood pressure that has been 
present for a prolonged period of time and untreated are more likely to have atrial fibrillation. What happens is that the, eighth, uh, the hypertension causes increased stress on the heart. Oftentimes the heart will have to change. The heart is a muscle. Like any muscle, when it has to work harder, the, the muscle becomes more thick. The chambers start to become thickened and the atria start to stretch to accommodate that increased load. So those changes in the morphology of the heart can lead to these signals that become, you know, that become stimulated and lead to atrial fibrillation. Diabetes, obesity, there's other issues like heart valve problems. If you have a valve problem that is leading to an obstruction of blood flow to the rest of the body or a leaky valve that leads to stretch of some of the chambers, that can also lead to AFib. And then there are other conditions like thyroid problems. If you have an overactive or even underactive thyroid, that can cause um, AFib. Sleep apnea, apnea can increase stress on the heart. And excessive alcohol. We often see pa younger patients who've had you know, a weekend of binging. That is a toxin on the heart that can lead to the heart getting stressed out and an AFib episode. So the tests that we use to diagnose atrial fibrillation are an EKG. That's when we put leads on the, on the chest and get a printout of what the heart rhythm looks like. What we're looking for is sinus rhythm, you know, a normal heart rhythm. But in atrial fibrillation, you'll see that the distances between, the time between the every heartbeat is irregular. It's not that normal cadence of the normal heartbeat. Chest x-rays are done because people with atrial fibrillation can develop lung problems. They can develop heart failure. So we want to make sure that there's no issues there. An echocardiogram is a sonogram of the heart. It's a non-invasive way to take a video image of the heart to see how well the heart's functioning. We can look at how the heart's beating in the chest in real time. We can look at the measurements of the chamber sizes, how big the atria are, how thick the, the muscle is, and look for any maybe reasons why somebody is in atrial fibrillation, like the valve problems that I mentioned. There's a procedure that I do in the hospital called a transesophageal echo, and that's a sonogram also, but it's a more invasive study. What I do is I put a probe, which has a, like a, a not a video camera, but an ultrasound probe at the tip, and I put it in a patient's mouth into their esophagus, and the esophagus is located behind the heart, so I can get a very good look at the heart from the valves from inside the body. I often do this test to make sure that there are no clots in the heart, because that's where I can get a very good look at the atria and make sure that there are no clots before I do an intervention. And then an ambulatory ECG monitor can be helpful because like I mentioned, sometimes people have paroxysmal or intermittent atrial fibrillation. They're not an AFib all the time, but you know, it's hard to capture it. If you're not in, it, in the office and we do an EKG and you're in sinus rhythm, that doesn't mean that you don't have atrial fibrillation. It just, just means that you were, didn't have atrial fibrillation at that moment. So with these ambulatory monitors, we put it's a mobile device um, that you, not mobile in terms of cell phone, but um, uh, amulet or something that you can wear outside. And there are EKG leads that are hooked up to you. And it can be either a 24 hour Holter monitor or a longer monitor called like a Xyo patch where you wear it for about two weeks and it collects all the, um, the rhythm of the heart rhythm for the past two weeks. And it'll let me know if you have AFib what is the AFib burden, how often you're in it, and when you're in AFib, how long are those episodes? So in terms of prevention, I recommend that preventing, the most important step is just trying to prevent AFib from happening in the first place. And so the best way to do that is to look at your risk factors and take your medications as prescribed. Control blood pressure, control diabetes, having a nutritious diet, regular exercise, maintaining a healthy weight. That extra weight can lead to higher blood pressure, more stress on the heart, sleep apnea. Those are things that we want to avoid. And if you have AFib already, it's important to recognize the triggers 
and to avoid those triggers. Sometimes people are under a lot of stress, so it's important to minimize their stress. Or they drink a lot of alcohol, it's important to lower your alcohol intake. Try to understand what are your triggers of atrial fibrillation and how you can prevent it. And lastly, there's something called a CHAD score. This is a risk factor algorithm that helps doctors determine how likely a patient has is of having a stroke in the future. And that will determine how aggressive the doctor is for prevention, for treatment and preventing the strokes. So it is a it count, takes into account a woman's age, whether or not she has hypertension, diabetes, whether or not she's had a stroke before because people who've had stroke are at higher risk of stroke in the future, and whether or not they've had heart failure symptoms because people who have heart failure are also at higher risk for having AFib. If you have a low CHAD score, that means that your risk of stroke is on the lower side and maybe the doctor doesn't need to be so aggressive with blood thinners. But as soon as your risk starts to increase, um, it is beneficial to start blood thinners to prevent these debilitating strokes. So in terms of treatment, there's really two main pillars that we're looking at for treatment. We're one, number one, we want to prevent strokes from happening. And then number two, we want to control the atrial fibrillation so that the AFib doesn't progress and lead to heart failure. So when it comes to blood thinners, there are different types of blood thinners. There are something, something called an anticoagulant, which prevents the clotting from happening. And then there's aspirin, which is not a true anticoagulant. It's actually an antiplatelet error agent that is helpful but not as helpful as an actual anticoagulant. There is warfarin which is also known as Coumadin. This medication has been around for a really long time. We have a lot of information about it. People have been taking it for years. It's relatively safe. The only issue with warfarin is that you need to be monitored while you're on warfarin. Um, if you're on too much warfarin that can lead to very high bleeding risk. Your blood is too thin. If you're on really not enough warfarin, then your blood is too thin or too, uh, not, is not, you know, it's not thin enough and it's not effective. And so there's a blood test that needs to be performed to, called an INR that needs to be checked regularly while you're on warfarin. Initially, when warfarin is started, you need to start taking, getting the blood test quite regularly to try to make sure that you're on the appropriate dose for warfarin because that dose will be different in any, in all different people, depending on a lot of different factors. Their age, how much they weigh, what other medications they take. Warfarin can often have interactions with other medications. And it doesn't mean that you can't be on warfarin, it just means that you need to be monitored. Your diet can also affect warfarin. If you're eating a lot of leafy greens, you, the warfarin might not affect, uh, work as effectively. But I don't recommend not eating greens. I just recommend having a very consistent, healthy diet. And then we can adjust the warfarin based on what you're taking. So that's warfarin. It's pretty safe. It's been around. But sometimes it can be inconvenient, or not sometimes, oftentimes it's inconvenient for patients. And so there are newer agents that have been introduced in the last five to 10 years that are called novel anticoagulants. We call it NOAX or NOAC, that don't need to have the regular blood tests, don't need to be monitored. Unfortunately, they're more expensive than warfarin. Sometimes when you're taking it, they don't. there's not a great reversal agent. So if you have a bleeding episode, a major bleeding episode, an accident, we can't just stop the effects right away. We have to let it resolve over time after, uh, let it kind of resolve over the next couple of days. So, so important to be on blood thinners if you have a high risk of stroke. And if you have AFib, your doctor routinely will measure your CHAD score your risk factors and determine whether or not a, a anticoagulant is appropriate for you. I mentioned briefly that aspirin probably is okay, but it's not ideal. It doesn't have the same kind of data in terms of preventing strokes. If you're very young and you don't have risk factors, probably okay, ideal, ideal to take. But I don't recommend it in older patients unless they have a real good reason that they can't take an anticoagulant if they've had 
um, if they're you know falling a lot, et cetera. So the next part of treatment is really the AFib itself and trying to keep people in normal rhythm as long as possible. You just feel better when you're in normal rhythm. The heart works better when you're in normal rhythm. So if a patient is having AFib just intermittently, I'll do what I can to try to keep them in normal rhythm. That includes treating comorbidities, so all those risk factors that we talked about. You really need to identify those, try to get those under control. The heart rhythm, there are rhythm control med medications that patients can take to try to keep them in, a in normal rhythm. And also, there's a procedure called an ablation, which is an invasive procedure. It's a catheter-based procedure, not surgery. A catheter is placed into the leg threaded up into the heart chambers, into the atrium, and these specialist electrophysiologists can try to locate the connections where the atrial fibrillation is coming from and use energy or cryotherapy to get rid of those connections and treat the AFib. Sometimes people come into the hospital acutely with atrial fibrillation and their heart is beating really fast and erratically and they're in discomfort or they have heart failure, I might do a cardioversion, which is an electrical procedure it's where I put pads on the patient's body, on the chest, and we zap them. We actually put them out with anesthesia, you're completely asleep, and you don't remember anything, and it's just a quick zap to the heart to try to restart the heart. That's unfortunately a temporary measure. So it's really good in the acute setting when people are hospitalized or maybe in the outpatient side, I'm trying to get them on medications but it's not working well. We'll do that, but it's not a long-term fix. The long-term fixes are treating your risk factors, treating the things that are leading to the atrial fibrillation, and then maybe thinking about ablation and then there's also a surgery called maze. It's an open heart surgery where they can try to get rid of it as well. Some people are going to always be in atrial fibrillation no matter what. That's called chronic atrial fibrillation. Those are usually older patients that have been in atrial fibrillation a really long time. Their heart just wants to be in atrial fibrillation. We've done all these procedures, we've done all these medications to try to get them into normal rhythm and it just doesn't work. But a lot of times, those patients don't even feel that badly on it and the heart's still beating okay. As long as the heart's not going super, super fast, it's okay for them to have chronic atrial fibrillation. Our goal there is, is rate control, where we give them medications to make sure that the heart's not going above 100 beats per minute, that they're feeling comfortable, that, you know, that, that at least the heart function is working, is working well. So I've stressed blood pressure. It's really one of the main modifiable, treatable things that patients can do to prevent atrial fibrillation, and also if they already have atrial fibrillation, prevent future episodes. One in three Americans have high blood pressure, and I call it a silent killer because a lot of people who have high blood pressure don't even realize that they have high blood pressure. It's not something that they're going to feel unless their blood pressure is really high over time. And the majority of people who have high blood pressure are not treated effectively or they're not at the target where they should be. So it's important to know your numbers, get a blood pressure cuff, go to Walgreens, measure your blood pressure, check a few times a month, maybe if you have a really, um, if it's a big problem for you, you might have to check it more often. And you should know that your goal is in this range, 120 over 80, maybe a little higher if you're older and you're but if you're having 140 or over 90 and you have a lot of heart problems in addition, it, you will need to be on medications to try to reduce that. You can also do some lifestyle interventions to try to improve it. So it's important to know your numbers, track your progress, think about your diet, limiting so sodium and alcohol, limiting how much you're eating in terms of portion sizes, and increasing physical activities. Those are all strategies that you can take to try to decrease your blood pressure. And then sleep apnea is a very important topic that I think people, that, that doesn't have enough attention. And it's really important in heart disease because when people have sleep apnea, the heart and the body is working harder than it needs to be. So what is sleep apnea? 
It's a, a condition that occurs when you're sleeping, you're, you're not getting enough oxygen. And what, uh, usually it's because you might have increased tissue in the throat, you're, you know, you might have, be larger, although underweight and normal weight individuals can have it as well. So when you're sleeping and in a really deep stage of sleep, your muscles are all very relaxed. And those muscles that hold up the throat, the tongue, they don't keep, stay up. And so that becomes relaxed, the tongue rolls back and you're obstructing the airway. So over time, chronically, the, there can be just lower levels of oxygen in the bloodstream. It might not be a lot, but if you think you know, you're sleeping six hours every night, that's over, and, you know, 365 days a year, that's a, that's a lot of increased stress on the, on the body. Your heart can start to have increased stress hormone. It puts more pressure, strain on the heart. The heart starts to change and it can increase blood pressure and increases the risk of AFib. So when I have patients who have atrial fibrillation and they are, they have obvious risk factors for sleep apnea, I encourage them to go to a sleep medicine provider to get evaluated for sleep apnea and get treated for it because that's, it has been shown that treatment of a sleep apnea can reduce AFib episodes. And I have this slide up because, you know, this, we're in a, a room full of women and women often are the caretakers of their families. So if you don't have atrial fibrillation, it's very likely that you might know someone who has atrial fibrillation. Maybe your husband has atrial fibrillation. And caretakers will often become the experts in atrial fibrillation and they know what kind of symptoms their loved one is having. They know that they're making sure that their loved ones are taking medications at the right time. And so important for caretakers also to be aware of what kind of questions to take, ask their doctor, how to act as an uh, advocate for their loved one. So I really want to commend everyone for, for being here. I think that just being interested in your health is so important. And I just want to give some tips on what I think would, is helpful for patients. It's important to be proactive and empower yourself. It's important to learn about your condition, what kind of options you have for treatments, and take the necessary steps that you can, that are take the steps that are necessary to make your therapy a success. When you're at a doctor's visit, write down what your concerns are beforehand so then you can be ready to ask your doctors about it. Make the lifestyle changes that you need to reverse your heart disease and reduce your chances of having a stroke. And lastly, these are my take home points. You know, AFib is an abnormal rhythm. Symptoms include palpitations, but sometimes they can be vague or absent altogether. The most serious complication is a stroke and women have a higher risk of stroke and have more debilitating strokes. The common risks include high blood pressure, diabetes, and sleep apnea. And it's important to take medications to lower stroke risk. So I mentioned that I'm a cardiologist in, with Washington Township. My office is just across the street. It's on Maori, but the entrance is on Stivers. And you can visit my website. If you want more information about your health conditions, I'd be happy to see you.